Okay, very good. Uh, one thing I, uh, I forgot to mention at the very beginning, I would like to, in, in addition to members from the St. Louis Audubon Society and uh, members from the Webster Groves Nature Study Society, uh, I understand we may have a few guests of Mike's who came along. Um, and I hope and uh, that if you made it out here on time or, or made it, that's fantastic. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. And I'd love to uh, uh, just want to welcome you to, the, to this meeting. Uh, and it's something uh, we find very, uh, it's really neat when we get new people to show up on at our meetings, even if they are virtual. Tonight, uh, I'm going to introduce our speaker, uh, Mike Webster. He is, uh, well, he was somebody I, I kind of find very interesting when I went and did a little research on you, Mike. Uh, you actually wear two hats, it's from what I can tell. Uh, <laughs> the first hat is your professor. Uh, you're professor of the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior at Cornell University, very prestigious school out east. Uh, your, uh, your, your area of interest is the evolution of reproductive sec uh, strategies and uh, sexual signals, primarily in birds. So you can imagine this is a, uh, a topic that caught my attention when I was doing research on who we could get for a speaker for uh, these meetings of ours. Uh, currently, he's teaching a graduate school program in animal communication. And I imagine most of that is also about birds, too. Uh, they seem to be very popular for research subjects. Uh, if you go online and look, he's a prolific writer uh, with at least 75. You've listed 75 publications. These are peer-reviewed publications, uh, primarily about birds uh, and uh, various research topics on them. And uh, anybody can go online and take a look at that. It's a very, a very interesting list of uh, work that you've been, been involved in. So that's the first hat is the professor. And uh, the second hat is something that uh, uh, really caught my attention as well because he, you, uh, Mike Webster is a director of the Macaulay Library. Uh, Macaulay Library, for those of you that uh, aren't uh, quite so familiar, is the largest has the largest repository of bird photos and bird sounds in the world, as far as I can tell, the world. Uh, and Mike is the director of the facility, so he's responsible for the libraries, every everything there is that's going on in that library, and it's uh, quite extensive because you've got quite a research staff that works there. There's at least ten people I counted on on your staff, uh, and. That is, it's, you got a building, a gorgeous building that's involved with that. So it's uh, really impressive. Uh, but the thing that caught my attention was, is that you may, uh, during your, uh, you know, you talk about things that you do, you actually went and you went out of your way to talk about the outreach activities that are going on at the Macaulay Library. And I just wanted to list a couple of these here. Uh, and the first one, uh, right down my alley because I'm interested in evolution is the uh, basically Macaulay Library is one of many institutions that is uh, works at cleaning up misunderstandings about evolution. You, everybody knows how much that can be a problem, especially those of us that live here in Missouri. Uh, uh, there are a lot of people in Missouri that tend not to believe in evolution. Uh, so I, I found that really very important and I really appreciate the, the work that you do in that area. Uh, the other area that's very big in the topic of everybody, tip of everybody's tongue is climate change. And so the Macaulay Library uh, being about birds is what does climate change do to birds? And of course, that's really critically important that we get as much information about that as possible in the coming years. And the last topic that they, uh, they have and they do is the teaching others. And I'm, I'm calling tonight's presentation uh, part of teaching others. So, so with that, that, I'd like to introduce uh, Mike Webster, Dr. Mike Webster, uh, with his talk, Bird Chat, How and Why Birds Are Talking to Each Other, How We Know, and Why We Should uh, Listen to Them. With that, thank you very much, Mike, and welcome. Uh, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks very much, Rich, for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, I'll say, actually, these days... <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm wearing three hats because I'm currently the president of the American Ornithological Society as well. And the only reason I bring that up is because 
Um, for the last couple of years, my time has been super constrained. I've had to actually turn down more opportunities like this one than I've been able to accept. But when I got the invitation from you, I just absolutely had to accept this one for several reasons. Uh, one is that I figure given my last name, I must have some family roots there in Webster Grove. And so in case any of my relations are listening, I wanted to definitely uh, uh, accept this invitation. Um, and the other reason is that um, my good friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Gabe Kolbeck is at Maryville University there. And this is an opportunity to see Gabe again, even if it's only virtually. And I did see his face pop up in one of these rectangles a few minutes ago. So it's great to be with you all. I really appreciate the invitation. Um, and I think I will start sharing my screen here. Great, so Rich, you can see that, thumbs up. Yep. Okay, great. So yeah, so I, what I wanted to do today is talk a little bit about um, some of the things that we do in the Macaulay Library with respect to research and understanding birds better and monitoring birds and, and frankly, conserving birds. A lot of the outreach we do, we do do the sort of outreach that Rich was talking about a minute ago, um, but a lot of the outreach we do right now is focused on getting people engaged with nature and understanding nature better. Because as we know, um, bird populations are declining. We lost 3 billion birds over the last few decades here in, the, in North America. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the Lab of Ornithology, we're more or less dedicated to turning that curve around and stopping the decline and get the populations increasing rather than decreasing. So what I wanted to do today is first give just a very brief introduction to what the Macaulay Library is because it's, it's sort of hard to wrap your head around what, what sort of an institution it is. Um, and then I wanted to tell three different stories about the Macaulay Library and how it's used to understand bird biology and bird conservation. So we'll start by talking about the Macaulay Library itself. I think the best way to think about the Macaulay is that it is a research collection. It's a, it's a biological collection. It's basically a museum like any other research collection. Um, and so we have specimens, but the big difference between us and most other biological collections is that the specimens we have are, are not skins and bones like we're seeing in this picture. So here's a, a well-known um, ornithological collection um, at the Smithsonian Institution. Um, and it's built from specimens, and these specimens and these collections like the Smithsonian um, really have formed the backbone of research on birds and other organisms. They really are, are, have been instrumental in helping us understand the distribution of birds, the evolution of birds, the ecology of birds, um, and just all the various aspects, anatomy, you name it, of, of birds and other organisms. And the reason these kinds of research collections are useful for that, for that is that they're composed of many, many, many specimens. And so here's one example here, a, a couple of specimens of the magnificent rifle bird, um, which is a bird from Northern Australia and Papua New Guinea. And a bird, these sorts of specimens are useful to research because a researcher can pick the specimen up and they can measure the bill size, they can measure the wing length, they can measure the toe length, they can measure all sorts of things about the specimen to better understand anatomy, differences between males and females and what have you. And these days with modern techniques, there's, there's even more you can do. You can extract chemicals from feathers, you can extract DNA from the specimens, you can do CT scans of the specimens, you can do all sorts of things that open up new doors for discovery about the biology of birds and other animals. And the reason you can do all of this and the reason these specimens are so valuable for research is that they capture the traits. The specimen is the collection of traits that makes up a particular individual at a particular place and time. So we can examine those traits and we can look at variation in traits over space and time. Um, and I, I should have said right at the beginning of this that I um, am going to show a few videos in this PowerPoint. Um, they may, PowerPoint and videos over Zoom don't always work really well. So the videos might be a little jerky. Um, there's some audio, hopefully the audio will be just fine. But if this, the videos look a little jerky to you, um, apologies for that. Um, but the, uh, 
the main point, you can get the main point without actually seeing the smooth video. Um, and so what I wanted to say here is that specimens are valued because they, valuable because they capture all these traits and, uh, and scientists can measure those traits and study them. But there is one large category of traits that a typical biological specimen does not capture. Um, and, and so for these rifle birds that I'm showing here, these specimens of rifle birds, that, that, tr that trait looks like this. So that's a male and a female rifle bird interacting with each other, right? This is behavior and a specimen, a typical physical specimen cannot capture behavior. And behavior is an important part of the biology of an animal. So this is a male rifle bird talking to the female, right? He's talking with his plumage and he's talking with his physical display. And if you can hear it, he's actually making sounds because he has modified feathers on his wings that when they rub against each other, produce a sound. Um, so this is, this is a category of traits, behavioral traits that a typical physical specimen does not capture. Um, and here's another example of the same species. His beak is nicely curved. <laughs> That's a male calling for a female. Here's another male a few hundred kilometers away. Come on. The calls are different, right? So even though this is the same species in different areas of its range, these species, these animals sound different from each other. They have different calls. And it's that kind of variation across space and across time that intrigue scientists. We want to understand why that variation exists and why it's important. And without specimens or something to study, it's hard to get at those kinds of questions. And so that's what the Macaulay Library is. The Macaulay Library is a collection of specimens, but they're media specimens. They're audio recordings, video recordings, and photos that capture the behavioral traits of, of individuals. And, and the whole reason we exist is so that those videos, those audio recordings and those photos can be studied by scientists. It's nice that they also sound pretty. So like this musician ran, it's a very, very pretty song. It's gorgeous to listen to, but it's also a scientific specimen because Ted Parker, who's the guy shown in this photo here, recorded that wren and collected the data as to where he was and when he recorded it, we know what a musician wren sounded like in that part of Peru on that day in 1982. And we can study how the birds sound there now, how they sound in different places. It's that kind of variation that we want to try to understand if we want to understand birds and also conserve birds. Musician wren. So, so that was a really brief and quick introduction to the Macaulay Library. Now what I want to do is tell you just a few stories about the Macaulay Library. And I'm going to start with a, a, a story or two about the very early days when the library first began. Uh, Mike, I just might mention, sorry to interrupt, but your, your videos are coming in very nicely. Oh, good. I That's great thought, to hear. Thought you'd like to hear that they're they're working. I am glad to hear that. And I the, thought everybody the, would just be seeing something very uh, you know awful. Oh no, <laughs> so they're, thank you they're for good, that, and the sound the sounds are also coming through quite clearly. Beauty. Okay, you just made my night. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so for the early days, I want to take us back to about 1929. So this is a picture of Arthur Allen, who is actually the person that started the Cornell Lab of Ornithology back in 1915, I think was the year when he started it. Um, and in, 19, in the 1920s, the late 1920s, he was approached by some people who were in the movie making industry. And they uh, approached him. So Ithaca, you, some of you may or may not know, Ithaca was actually a movie making hub back in the early 1900s. There was a, st a studio here called Wharton Studios and they made a lot of silent films. And so 
because of that, this region, there was a lot of industry devoted to the movie industry and a lot of research to try and figure out how to make movies better. And one of the great innovations that came along in the 1920s was sound synced film or uh, what we call talkies, right? And so they wanted, they came up with this new amazing cutting edge technology of talking films um, or sound synced films and they wanted to test it. And so the people who came up with that technology approached Arthur Allen at the Lab of Ornithology and asked him if, they, if he thought it would be possible to actually record or film birds singing. And Arthur Allen said, I have no idea. Why don't we try it? So they took some cameras down to Stewart Park, which is the city park here in Ithaca. And on that day, they recorded three birds singing. One of those was a uh, rose-breasted grosbeak. Um, the, another was a song sparrow. And I think the third was probably a house run or something. I can't remember what the third one was. But they filmed those birds singing. The film doesn't exist anymore, but the audio from those films was transferred to tape many years ago. And so I just want to play you that right now. LNS catalog number 16968. So you're listening to the very first recording of a, a singing bird ever made in North America. So the, the experiment worked really well. And Doc Allen, basically a light bulb went on over his head. And he's like, this technology is really amazing. We can actually go out in nature and document the behavior of animals. We can film them and we can record their audio, what they sound like, we can record their signals. And so he started then on a mission to go around with some of his students and record as many species of birds as they could. And then they soon branched off into frogs as well. And one famous video that they captured was the, of the ivory-billed woodpecker um, in the 1930s. And, and Doc, Allen's intention back in the 1930s was to try and record and capture on film the behavior of animals that were on the brink of extinction. Um, he wanted to preserve the, the behavior of those animals so that later generations could see how they behaved, hear them, and understand the biology of these animals that he feared would disappear. And so that was his big goal at the time was to capture these, these kinds of films and, and these kinds of recordings to document the behavior of these animals that were look like they would soon disappear. Whoops. But that was, that was sort of the start. Um, soon other technological innovations came along that allowed the growing Macaulay Library to be used for other kinds of research. And so I want to talk about one of the research projects that Dr. Allen did with his graduate student, Peter Paul Kellogg, um, also in the 1930s. And it revolves around this sound. I'm going to see if anybody can tell me what this sound is. So I don't know if you can hear that, but uh, um, because it, it would have to have pretty good speakers. It's a low reverberation sound. Yep, rough okay, grass. Anne McCormick. Anne McCormick in the chat. Yep, I hear several people saying rough grass now. That's exactly what it is, right? And back in the 1930s, there was a big debate going on about how do rough grouse make that drumming sound? Do they beat their feet on the log? Are they using their wings? Is it a vocalization? What exactly is it? And so to get at this question, um, Peter Paul Kellogg and Doc Allen went to a drumming log of a rough grouse that they knew of near Ithaca, and they, they strapped up a microphone next to the drumming log, and it's, you can see Kellogg strapping it up right now. And then they put a, a movie camera nearby, and Peter Paul Kellogg laid next to the log because they didn't have any sort of remote devices back then. He laid next to the log and they, they covered it with leaves and they waited for the male to come and start doing his drumming. And when he did that, 
Kellogg hit the go button on the camera and the audio recorder, and they were able to show that this, the sound that the animal was producing was perfectly synchronized with his wing beats. And what the bird is doing is compressing air very rapidly against its chest with his wings, and that's what's producing the drumming sound. And they published a paper on that in the 1930s, 1939, I think it was. And it was the very first scientific paper that ever used media to address a biological question. But then, you know, a lot of more advances came along in the 1950s. People invented a, a way of actually turning a sound into something we could look at and visualize. Um, we call that a sonogram or a spectrogram. So here's a song sparrow. This is the spectrogram or the sonogram of a song sparrow song. And those blobs there represent notes. Um, the darker blue, the color, the louder, the more amplitude in the sound. And the, the um, frequency is on the y-axis and the time is along the x-axis of this. And so the, this bird song, this song that you see pictured in the sonogram sounds like this. So it's sort of high, low, high, low, high, trill, whir, whiz, right? So that's, that's this, uh, this, this bird song. And I'm gonna play it again at slower speed and follow with your eyes because you can actually pair your eyes up with the sound and actually appreciate it a lot better. So that's, that's the song of this song sparrow, both visually with the spectrogram and also acoustically, you could hear it. And this invention of spectrograms just opened up the door for acoustic research because once you can turn a sound into a picture, you can measure things. You can you can measure the frequencies. You can measure how long the notes last. You can actually turn that raw recording into data that can be analyzed. And so this this technology has been the backbone of a lot of acoustic research ever since. And they're also fun to watch these movies and listen to them at the same time. So I'm going to play just for fun a few birds and show the spectrogram at the same time. So here's a wood thrush. And I think you can appreciate it even more if you slow it down. Um, so this is the same song at one quarter speed. So I like doing that because it's really cool to watch. It kind of sounds otherworldly, but it also allows your eye to follow your ear a lot better. And it's also a lot closer to what the birds are hearing because birds have a lot better temporal resolution than humans do. So notes that blur together for us and we can't really distinguish them, birds can actually distinguish them much better than we can. They can distinguish those notes that are put together really closely in time. Here's another sound I love. So that's a song of a Crestodora pendula. And this one, when you slow it down, is just amazing. So to me, that sounds like somebody, you know, running their finger down the strings of a harp or something like that. And it immediately makes me wonder, how does that animal make that kind of sound? Here's a Pacific wren. Just a, an amazing songster. And when you slow this one down, you can really appreciate the, the nuance of the notes. It sounds like a, a jazz musician improvising. It's just amazing you know, the ability of a bird to make that kind of, kind of sound. It's, you know, how, how can they possibly do that? And there has been a lot of research into how birds produce song in recent years using recordings like this and then creative lab procedures to figure out exactly how they do it. 
And what we now know is that first off, birds have a voice box like we have. In mammals, we call, call it the larynx. In birds, it's called the syrinx. And instead of being up in the throat like it is for us, it's actually down where the two, where the windpipe splits into two tubes going one to each lung. And the syrinx sits right at that point where, the, where that tube splits into two. And because of that, a bird has basically two voice boxes. It has two sound boxes, two sets of vocal cords that can each be used independently. And so a bird can sing out of the left side of its syrinx and out of the right side of its syrinx independently, either at the same time or separate, and can produce very sharp notes that are very different from each other, very fast in time. So just to illustrate that, here's a brown-headed cowbird. It doesn't have the prettiest sound, uh, but this is the song of the brown-headed cowbird. The spectrogram is, it, it's the, uh, a low introductory note, and then a couple sets of warblers, and then a high um, couple of notes at the very end, and it sounds like this. Okay, just one more time, real quick, that's all it is. But what's amazing is that sound is made by the bird switching back and forth very rapidly between the two sides of its syrinx. So now I'm going to show the sonogram, but now I'm going to label each note as to whether it comes from the left or the right side of the syrinx. So the L's are the left side of the syrinx and the R's are the right side of the syrinx. And you can see what the bird's doing is switching back and forth very quickly, like a sort of internal duet inside of its own anatomy. Um, and it sounds, again, this is the normal speed. And now I'm gonna slow it way down to one eighth of its normal speed. And you can really appreciate what the bird's doing when he's switching back and forth between the two halves of its syrinx. So you can see that it was like doo 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 doo, doo 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 doo, you know, going back and forth really quickly between the different halves of its syrinx. That's just an amazing ability that birds have that mammals don't have because we have one set of vocal cords, not two. Okay, so that was some of the early research using recordings in the Macaulay Library. Um, now I want to I want to bring us into the modern day. What are the new things that people are doing? And I'm only going to tell one story here. There's a lot of stories I could tell. Um, but I, I'm just going to highlight one because I think it's an interesting story. I'd be happy to talk about more during Q&A. Um, but the story I want to tell now um, takes place at the rainforest down in Ecuador. I've tried to orient you by showing where you all are in Webster Grove compared to um, Ecuador. Um, and down in Ecuador, there's this bird, the club doing mannequin. And it makes this call. Kind of a tick ting. Tick ting, tick ting. And this is the sonogram of that call. So there's a quick tick and there's a ting, and the ting is a pure tone with harmonics. And the pure tone, the lowest fundamental frequency of that tone is at about one and a half kilohertz. The question is, well, how does this bird make this sound? Is it using its voice? Is it using its syrinx or is it doing something different? Here's a movie of a club wing mannequin male producing this song. The video is a little quiet. You may not be able to hear it, but you can see what he's doing. So he has kind of a little backward walk display. And at the end of every little backward walk, he makes that sound. And every time he makes a sound, he's lifting his wings behind his back. So here's a photo of a male mannequin singing and he's lifting his wings behind his back every time he produces that sound. So that suggested to Kim Bostwick, who's the researcher, who's a friend of mine, a colleague and a researcher who did this research. And Kim saw this and it suggested to her that the male was actually creating the sound with his wings rather than with his voice box. And so what she did is she went down to Ecuador with a high speed camera and she filmed males producing their sounds. And so the, on the 
right hand of the screen here, I'm gonna show a high speed video of a male making the ting call of his, his, voc of his, his um, advertisement call. So this is what it looks like. So what he's doing is he's lifting the wings behind his back and he's beating them together very, very, very quickly. In fact, he's beating them together 107 times per second. That's faster than a hummingbird beats its wings. And every time the male beats his wings together behind his back, it causes the feathers on, on his primaries, on his wing feathers, to rub against each other. And on one of those feathers is highly modified. So Kim did the anatomy and looked at microscopically at the feathers. One feather has a series of seven or eight ridges on it. And the feather that rubs over the top of it has a single ridge that acts like a, a, a little file. And when the bird beats its wings together, that file is rubbing against the ridges seven times and then for each beat and you do that 107 times per second and you get a 1.5 kilohertz buzz and so this is what the animation looks like so the feathers rub together to produce that sound so this is amazing this isn't a sound that an, a bird is making without using its voice box. It's using its wings, it's using modified feathers. And, and you may have know of woodcock and other birds that do similar kinds of things. And the more we look, the more we realize that there are a lot of birds out there that produce acoustic signals, audio signals, using things other than their voice box. They use modified feathers, they drum, they do all sorts of things that produce signals that other birds respond to. So mannequins are awesome birds. I, I, I can't, um, you know, go any further without just like talking about one more mannequin. If for any of you have been to the Neotropics, you know that mannequins have amazing displays and the males are vibrantly colorful. Um, and there's just, they're just stunning little birds to watch. Um, and this is one species of mannequin though, that is not so stunning. This is the black mannequin um, and it is, a mannequin that is just one color. It's all black. It doesn't have reds and blues and yellows splashed across it. Um, so in that sense, it's very different from most mannequins. And that little video you're watching is the male giving his display. And it's really an incredibly boring display. He's just jumping up and down. There's none of the, the really amazing acrobatics that we see in other mannequins. But that got my friend Lainey Day and Willa Lindsay and Justin Howe interested because they're like, well, is this really that boring of a display? All of the other mannequins are doing amazing things. Let's look more closely. And so they also went down with a high speed camera and they videoed the black mannequins display at high speed so that they could look at the details of it. And I'm going to show the high speed film here now. So it's slowed way down so you can see what that bird is doing. Um, he's going to be, he's going to come up right in the middle of this video here. So what he's doing is a backflip. So this male, every time he jumps up in the air, is doing this incredible acrobatic flip that's happening too fast for the human eye to see. Um, our eyes only work so fast. The, the human eye has what's called a very slow flicker fusion rate. And so things that happen very fast, we actually can't see. Birds have high flicker fusion rates. They can see things that happen much faster than we can. And so a female mannequin can see this flip happening, even though we can't see it happening. And so these are just examples of people using modern technology to get at new kinds of questions and better understand how birds are communicating with each other, how they're, you know, some of the intricate details of the sounds they make, how they make those sounds, and of the acrobatic displays that they use when they're communicating.
Okay, so now what I want to do is switch gears and talk about what's happening right now, moving forward into the future. What is it that that people are doing, researchers are doing with with audio and video and and photos to better understand the biology of birds? And so for that, I want to take us to another another location. We're going to jump down now to Australia to the Blue Mountains outside of Sydney. Um, and this is work that was done by Anna Dalziel, who was a postdoc that worked with me here at Cornell. And Anna was interested in lyrebirds. And so this is a male lyrebird on his display mount. And I'm just going to let you watch this male display for a few minutes. So I love that video. You know, so this is a male lyrebird displaying. Um, what Anna is interested in is the coordination of the physical movements and the vocalizations and how, how and why birds do that. Um, so she's basically studying the evolution of dance. I mean, that you, you can see how coordinated the male's body movements were with his vocalizations. And that's what she's interested in. But what I want to talk about is not so much that, you know, what she's studying, but how she's doing it. That video was made by Anna just strapping a GoPro camera to a tree next to the male's mound. And that's kind of the point is now technology has gotten so inexpensive and so easy to use that we can put cameras all over the world and capture things that were previously unseen. Um, so, and a lot of people make hobbies of this, right? So a lot of people have game cams and, and wildlife cams in their own backyards just to know what kinds of animals are wandering by. And, and park rangers are putting them in parks and they're discovering things wandering by those cameras that they didn't even know were there. So these cameras are capturing wildlife moving past that are actually in many cases not known to be in the area. And, and in fact, the Lab of Ornithology, we have a whole side um, gig that we do, putting cams out to capture birds at nests and in other places. And we have thousands of people tune in to watch these, the, what's captured on these cameras because people find it interesting. So here's a heron cam that was actually outside of my office in the pond outside of my office for several years. Um, the birds actually eventually abandoned the nest after they'd used it for several years and the tree then eventually fell down in a storm. But for five or six breeding seasons, people were entertained by the breeding behavior of these herons, these great blue herons that were nesting in this nest. Um, and they, we captured videos like this one. Here's a mom bringing food back to the babies. So yeah, as I was saying, people love these films. They they turn the nest cams on their, their computer while they're working and just have them going on the side just in case anything interesting happens. 
And because the technology's gotten so good, oh, wait, no, I have another video. I forgot. Here's another video from that exact same Nest Cam. But this one's at night. So we have a pretty good camera on the Nest so they can actually pick up things at night. And what you're going to see is the parent sitting on the eggs of the, at the nest. So that was a great horned owl attacking a blue heron nest in the middle of the night. Uh, the, the, nobody was harmed. There are five eggs there. You can see there were five nestlings that hatched out later. So they, um, the, the young were okay. But that, that owl was trying to depredate the nest in the middle of the night. That's something nobody knew happened. We captured a very unique behavior, owls preying on great blue heron nests that had not been known to occur at all. And that's kind of the point here is that these cameras are now so easy to use um, that they can be put out at, in all sorts of locations at all sorts of times. And we're discovering a lot about nature that we did not previously know. And people are getting interested in bird photography and recording with um, inexpensive um, audio rigs or even iPhones. You know, you can go out and you can actually make a pretty good recording of a bird with your phone. And so what we at the Lab of O at, at, in the Macaulay Library, what we've done is really turned towards a citizen science approach of collecting data and monitoring birds across the globe to better understand what they're doing and where they are. And so to do that, what we did is we teamed up with eBird, another Lab of Ornithology program, about five or six years ago and made it possible for eBirders, bird enthusiasts to upload their photos and their audio recordings along with their eBird checklist. And so you can now upload audio and video with your eBird checklist. And that has had a dramatic, a dramatic effect on the growth of our collection. So when I came about 12 years ago to the Macaulay Library, we had about 200,000 um, audio recordings. Um, and then over the next few years, it grew to about maybe almost 400,000. And then in 2015, we opened up the gates to eBirders and the growth of the, of the collection just skyrocketed. We, this month or next month, we'll cross 1.5 million audio recordings in the Macaulay Library. And you can do a lot. You can do a lot of science when you have 1.5 million audio recordings. People can go in there and they can do all sorts of analyses, but you need to use different kinds of tools because you can't sit there, a, a researcher cannot sit there and listen to that many audio recordings and make spectrograms and measure things by hand. You need a very, very different approach. And the way, the approach that we've adopted and we've been really working hard on over the last few years is machine learning. So artificial intelligence approaches to analyzing sound. So here's a beautiful deciduous forest. Here's what it sounds like. And we can record this, this soundscape. And we could potentially use that recording to understand what birds are present at that place in time. But to do that, you need to use machine learning. And so here's our Merlin interface. You can, we, we've now put these algorithms on our Merlin app. So you can take your phone out. You, when you're birding, can take your phone out and you can hit the button and you can let the, the Merlin app on your phone listen to that soundscape and it will tell you what birds are singing. So that's, that is a machine learning approach. It's we've trained mathematical models to recognize certain kinds of bird songs and it identifies those. And so we can use those approaches for entertainment. You know, we can use it for ourselves when we're going out birding to learn bird songs better. But we can also use it for science because we can put autonomous recorders in isolated places and let those recorders go 24 seven and record all of the sounds that they do and they bring in so much data that a human can't sit down 
and analyze all those recordings, but a machine learning algorithm can't. And so we can use these sorts of recorders um, and, and the Lisa Yang Center for Bio, uh, Conservation Bioacoustics here at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology is really pushing the envelope and how to do this. They're really um, doing some cutting edge stuff of monitoring landscapes, monitoring soundscapes, monitoring the biodiversity in different areas um, at, by using acoustic recordings alone. And for example, during migration, which is coming upon us right now, very soon we're going to have warblers flying over our heads. When warblers are migrating at night, they give off species-specific calls. Um, they're called night flight calls. And so if you know what you're listening for, you, you can identify birds by year as they migrate over your house at night. You can also record those sounds as they're flying over and use machine learning algorithms to identify those birds. And with those algorithms and with these autonomous recorders, we can get a very sharp picture of when birds are, uh, are migrating, where they're migrating to and from, and what routes they're taking. So those are the kinds of things, just you know, scratching the surface here. So some of the kinds of things that are possible when you have media specimens, when you have audio recordings, video recordings, and photos, um, you can do these sorts of things. Um, which includes um, monitoring the diversity of birds out there, how many birds are out there, where are they, and when are they there, and when are they moving, when are they migrating. So to you know, conserve birds, we need to know where they are and how many are out there. And the other thing we need to know um, is we need to understand them. We need to understand their basic biology. So these Media specimens of this sort are helping us unlock some of these mysteries, along with the other approaches that biologists use. Media specimens are really helping us better understand and conserve birds. And I just wanna close with one more, one more movie. Um, and, and this is not a great movie. This is made in 1956 um, by Bill Ryan, um, who went down to Mexico and film the last known population of imperial woodpeckers. So some of you may know, the imperial woodpecker was the largest known woodpecker to ever exist. It dwarfs the ivory-billed woodpecker. It was about two times bigger than an ivory-billed. Um, just a massive, massive bird. Um, and it was on the brink of extinction in the 1950s. And Bill Ryan went down to Mexico and filmed the birds that he could find down there. And because he did that, because Bill Ryan made those, these films, even though the species is now extinct, there are no imperial woodpeckers left, we still today we know how they moved, how they bobbed their heads, how they probed on the tree, how they flew. You know, because of his effort to capture these movies, we know something about these birds that are sadly no longer with us. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. This has been a lot of fun and I would be very happy to answer any questions you might have. Looks like some questions are just coming in through the chat. Um, All right. Let's see, I have a question about video. How do we upload video through eBird? I have not been able to figure out how to do that. So currently we don't allow video to be uploaded to eBird directly because the files are so much larger. There is a constraint on that. Um, you know, this is um, five years ago, we were worried about uploading audio because of file size. And now that's not a problem. So I'm sure that in a few years we will have the capability to upload video, but currently the technology just doesn't allow it. So hopefully that'll change soon. Okay. Uh, we've got another one. I've been a Golden Wing Society member for over 20 years. In 2018, Great, glad to hear it. Yeah, we took advantage of our membership to visit the lab. Uh, I was blown away by the work that you all do. I'm so proud to support the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and I always tout eBird and Merlin to anyone I visit in the field. I guess that was more of a kudos than a question. Um, well, thank you, whoever, whoever wrote that. Great. I hope to see you back in Ithaca soon. <laughs> 
Um, let's see. Um, we have another, thank you for your presentation with the research being done. Are there findings that birds are changing their calls because of adapting to noise pollution caused by humans? Mm. Yes. Yeah. So the, the quick answer to that is absolutely yes. Birds in urbanized environments sing differently than birds in more rural environments because there is more human noise in urban environments. Um, and, and most of that noise is just sort of a low frequency rumble, uh, you know, trucks and all that kind of thing. And, you know, I call it the low frequency throb of humanity. You know, wherever there's a lot of people, there's a lot of low frequency noise. Um, and birds in urban areas sing at higher pitches than birds in more rural areas. Even the same species, if you compare within a species to birds, um, you know, individuals that live in a city compared to outside the city, they sing differently from each other. Um, and there are other more subtle differences, but that's just one difference. And people are just starting to understand that. And a very interesting twist on that that's sort of timely is that during the pandemic, especially the early days of the pandemic, um, a lot of humanity shut down. We, we weren't driving our cars. We weren't doing all of the noise making things that we do. And a lot of the birds in cities actually shifted their songs back. They sang more and they shifted their songs to lower frequencies during that time when humans were quieter. Now we've gotten louder again, you know, we're coming back and driving our cars and everything like that. So the birds are readapting to that change back. Okay. Uh, has audio analysis identification been used for insects or bats? Yes, actually, yeah. So, you know, I'm very, I'm a bird guy. So I tend to focus on birds. Um, so I, I should give due credit to all the awesome insect and bird work that's being done um, and also you know, whales, all sorts of different animals. These techniques that I'm talking about, they're being used to monitor birds and understand the language of birds are also being used to all these other animals. With something like bats, you know, it's a little more challenging. They vocalize outside our, our range of hearing, but you can still recording, record them at those frequencies and monitor them and, do, and study, study their vocalizations just the same way. Okay. Can I add to that a question? Uh, are you storing mm -hmm. the data at the Cornell Macaulay Library. Yes, so the Macaulay Library is not just about birds. We have recordings of insects, we have recordings of mammals, we have recordings, you know, whales, bats, all sorts of different things. Um, frogs, we actually have the world's largest frog um, audio collection. Um, but that said, probably 95% of the recordings we have are of birds. <laughs> Um, and through eBird, the only recordings that can come in through eBird are of birds. And so we continue to bring in recordings of other taxa, insects, frogs, mammals, um, but at a much lower rate. We're hoping that someday we have eFrog going and we can be bringing in frog vocalizations too. Very good. Okay. Uh, another question through chat. Do you suspect there are birds yet to be discovered? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Two ways. There are two ways that that's happening. Um, one is that there are just birds that have eluded us because they're living in very remote and difficult to find places. Um, and, and just last year, there were a couple of new species discovered that way, things that people didn't know were out there. Um, but the other way is to realize that some of these things that we think are a single species are actually more than one species. So um, the vocalizations and the audio recordings in the Macaulay have actually, that's one of the primary ways that they're used for research is to try and understand species limits. So looking at vocalization difference across the range of a species, if you find a sharp break in the kinds of vocalizations they give, the next step is then to go in and look and see if there's a genetic difference that is found at that same break. And people are finding all sorts of new species that way where there were sort of what we often call cryptic species. Okay, all right. Uh, before I read the next question, I, I do wanna invite anyone, you can take yourself off mute if you don't wanna type in a question on the chat and you're welcome to, uh, to chime in and ask. Um, but I do have another one in chat. Um, it says, I'm sure that I had uploaded video in the past. Was it a recent change to prohibit that? What happened to what I uploaded several years ago? So we 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 do take in audio. I'm sorry, video recordings. Um, 
And we've accepted those from people, but we've never had, the, unless it was for a very brief test period, um, we never had the ability to, to directly upload video through eBird. We might have had a short test period where we looked to see if that was possible, but that's never really been a capability to direct uploads through eBird. But you may have contributed video to the Macaulay Library and that video should be archived in there. We do have a little bit of a backlog. The nice thing about eBird is when people contribute to eBird, it goes directly into the archive because it's already digitized um, and it's already been sort of all the metadata been associated with it. If it's contributed some other way, then somebody in one of our studios needs to work with it and get it into the archive and, and that takes time. And so we do have a little bit of a backlog there. Okay. Uh, another comment, I enjoy making recordings of birds with my phone. Some are better than others. Are my low <laughs> quality recordings actually helping research? Yeah, so good. I'm glad you, whoever asked that, I'm glad you asked that because that's a question we get a lot and people um, get confused by. Um, uh, if you if you want to you like, you know, really wow your friends with your awesome recordings, you want a really pretty bird recording. But if you want to do science, a, a pretty poor recording is very, very useful. At the very least, even the worst recording or the blurriest photo is documentation that that bird was at that place in that time, right? So it's at least a voucher for the presence of the bird. Beyond that, it's useful for all sorts of things also. Um, and especially the machine learning approaches that I was talking about at the end, Poor recordings are actually really important for doing that, training the algorithms for machine learning. Um, we don't want just crisp, clean, really perfect recordings. We want things that have scratches. We want things that have slamming car doors in the background or barking dogs or whatever, because that in reality, these algorithms, you know, when you hold your phone up and try to identify a bird singing, there's going to be a barking dog in the background and the, the algorithm has to be able to deal with that. So those recordings are ex extremely useful for that sort of thing. Okay. Um, another question, are you doing anything with Borer Laboratory of Bioacoustics? Yeah, um, so the Borer Lab, is, it's in Ohio, at Ohio State University. Um, good friends of ours, you know, the, there are not that many, um, you know, bird sound or acoustic collections in the world. And we, we know, most of us know each other. And um, they're good friends. And we haven't directly like collaborated on a project for, for quite some time. In the old days, there were some collaborations. We haven't done that per se, because they've undergone a change of, of leadership there. And they're sort of trying to figure out exactly what direction they want to go in. But I'm hoping to be working with them again in the very near future. Right, OK. Uh, another question, do you have any collaboration with iNaturalist? Because recordings yeah. can be made on the app, which perhaps you could import such as you do with eBird recordings. Yeah, so we, we do work with iNaturalist um, in sort of an informal collaboration. They're, they're also developing machine learning algorithms for identifying species um, through photos and through um, recordings, as you said. Um, and so we've shared a lot of information with each other and helped each other out. There's a lot of sharing of knowledge. Um, iNaturalist is interested in doing more than just birds. And we're mostly focused on birds with respect to our machine learning stuff. And so we've been able to be a lot more focused and develop the models to have very high performance because we're more focused and we're not worrying about insects and frogs and things like that. They're doing a broader scale approach and trying to understand more things. And so their algorithms perform differently than ours on birds, but they're able to, you know, identify these other things too. So I would call it an informal, informal collaboration with the iNaturalist folks. They're out at the Cal Academy um, on the West Coast and, and um, friends of ours as well. Excellent. Um, that's all the questions we have in the chat box. I do want to draw people's attention to uh, just take a look at the, the chat communications because I skipped over a few that were just comments and I think a few people uh, shared some additional resources. Um, reminder, you can take off your microphone and or unmute yourself and ask a question and one more just came in. So I'll, I'll share, I'll ask that. Uh, when will Merlin audios be able to be submitted? Um, yeah, so that's really good. You can do that now. 
Um, it's just a little clunky right now. The way you have to do it now, you know, when you use Merlin to make a recording and it identifies a bird, you have the recording on your phone. Um, you can then take that recording and either by downloading it to your computer or doing it some other way, you can add that recording to an eBird list. So you can do it today. It's just not, it's just a little clunky. Um, and probably I would say, don't hold me to this, but I would say in two years, you'll be able to do it directly from the Merlin app. Um, so there will be a button to submit your recording. We just, that takes some development time. Okay. All right. Anyone else want to ask a question? Yeah, I, I would like to ask a question, Mike. Um, mm -hmm. Something like 10, 15 years ago, maybe um, even longer, uh, there was a claim that ivory billed woodpeckers were refound in Ar northern Arkansas. Uh, strikes me as one of the things that, you know, they showed photos and they were compelling, mm -hmm. uh, but nobody ever was able to reproduce it and find them again. But it strikes right. me as something where a bird that's very reclusive, if you stuck one of your microphones out there with that machine learning, and it sat there and listened for several weeks in the forest, uh, it might actually be able to find uh, an ivory billed woodpecker that's out yes. there. Yeah, is that, so uh, that's a great Is that point. the kind of stuff you're looking, looking to do with this? I'm hoping it is. Um, yes and no. Um, yes, that's exactly what we'd love to do. <laughs> but the difficulty is to train an algorithm, you need somewhere on the order of at least 100 um, decent recordings. So, the, uh, for ivory billed woodpecker, we just don't have the material to train an algorithm. We don't have a hundred recordings from the 1930s that we could use. Um, we do have a few, but it's just not enough. So the trick there it would be more roundabout. It would be to, you know, get a bunch of recordings there from things that um, uh, what we think an ivory bill could sound like and then exclude other things, right? Okay. Um, and so, you know, if you could say, yeah, that's that's ivory bill like, and it's not, you know, a pileated woodpecker or something like that, you could take that approach, but it's very roundabout. And at this point, until we have more training material, I don't think you could directly use those machine learning approaches. Um, but for a lot of other species, things that we, you know, a hundred recordings isn't actually that many. So there are some pretty rare species out there. Um, that we have a hundred recordings of, and we can train the models to, and then put the monitors, the recording units out there in nature to try and find other areas where those things live, where, where, where we may not be aware that they live. Okay. Um, I have a question, Mike, mm -hmm. uh, wonderful talk. I'm, I'm, I'm not a bird person, but I, I, I love hearing about them. Anyway, um, the, uh, I've heard, wind of uh, ivory bill woodpeckers in Cuba. Is that, mm -hmm. is that, could that somehow help with this search? Uh, yeah, absolutely. A lot of people think that if the ivory bill still exists, it's in, in, the, in Cuba. Um, there are a lot of really remote and difficult to get to sort of swampy forests in Cuba. And that's the kind of habitat that ivory bill likes. Um, and there certainly historically were ivory bill in Cuba. Um, so if anybody could discover a population of those down there, even a small population, we could get a few recordings, then we could train the models and start monitoring, you know, Missouri, Florida, some of the places in, in um, the U.S. where there have been rumors that ivory bills still exist. How good is that learning? So the, you know, would you be able to find all the birds as long as they've made noise in the forest or is it so, just the most, most yeah abundant? the performance yeah the performance of the models we have uh the after the machine learning models after they're well trained is about 95 percent um for for most species um and we have um a, a person that works here in the macaulay library um who's our machine learning guru and he's just a master of figuring out how to train the models better and better to identify, recognize and classify difficult species. So some species the models don't perform as well on, he's always fine tuning, turning the knobs and getting them to perform better. Um, so the, 
the performance is pretty good for most species. Right now in Merlin, I think there's 500 species that um, that you can identify by sound through Merlin. And all of those are above our threshold of, of, of identification, 85% or better. I have a few more questions that came in through chat. Um, we'll try to get to, do bird sounds change with environmental or climate conditions? That's a good question. Um, my, my gut answer is yes, but to be honest, I have not, I've not, you know, read any of that research. So I'm not positive. So like on cold days versus warm days and things like that, um, maybe. Um, so I, I, I'm going to have to give a pretty unsatisfactory answer to that one. <laughs> no problem. Another one, I find Merlin very useful on birding tours. Any idea when a Merlin pack for Thailand will be available? Thailand, Thailand. Um, you know, if you send me an email um, and I can give you my email address in a minute, I can give you a pretty good answer to that. We do have sort of a, uh, a hit list of when we want to release different packs. I just can't remember where Thailand is on that list right now. Um, we, we are we trying to increase the number of packs available for certain parts of Asia and also certain parts of Africa because those are areas where we don't have packs out yet. Um, so it's on the list. You know, people like to, to bird in Thailand. We want to get a pack out, but right now um, I can't remember what the date is. Okay. Uh, another one, do you have dedicated audio scientists and machine learning specialists directly working for Macaulay or do you use consultants as needed? Um, we, we actually have people on staff that do all that work. So the Macaulay staff is actually where more like 20 some that work in the Macaulay now and a good chunk of them are, um, programmers, software engineers and, and, um, acoustic scientists. Um, and, th and then we have Grant Van Horn, who is our machine learning guru, who kn um, knows how to do all of that. And we're very lucky that right across the hallway from us is the K. Lisa Yang Center for Conservation Bioacoustics. Um, and that's where the real um, bioacousticians work. And they, they, their whole mission is to use bioacoustic analysis to monitor biodiversity on the planet. And so whenever we have a hard question about bioacoustics that we can't answer, we can run across the hall. Okay. Uh, I think this is the last one in chat um, right now. How can we help Merlin better identify Eurasian tree sparrow sounds? Every time I record them, Merlin IDs them as house sparrows. <laughs> the Eurasian tree sparrow is, is one that is not currently in our um, pack of, of species that can be identified. Um, and right now, what we are doing is concentrating on different geographic regions um, and training our models. And we start with the most common species in each region. So right now we have about 500 species in North America that can be identified this spring, like in two or three weeks, we'll be identifying or we'll be releasing a pack that can identify birds in the Western Paleoarctic. Um, so Europe, basically, um, but it's only the most common birds in Europe. And, I, and so um, the Eurasian tree sparrow is not going to be in that group, I don't think, but soon after will be. And so it's the way you can help is by getting your friends or yourself, if you're in an area where these tree sparrows exist, record them, submit the recordings through eBird so we have the material to work with. We're right. very excited to release this pack for the Western Paleoarctic because that's going to open the doors in Europe for people to start using it there. I suspect Mike. you might get a few from St. Louis. We've you hit the, hit, yeah. the, hit the gold mine there. Yeah, I know. You, you guys have that bird down there. Record it. Send it in. Mike, yes. since uh, birds have dialects, is the IA learning adapting to that? Yes. Yeah. So to be honest, we've been working on this, um, you know, machine learning approach for over 10 years. And it was a really tough nut to crack. <laughs> um, and people kept saying to me and other people at the Lab of O, 
when are we going to have Shazam for birds, right? That was the question. We got it all the time. When are we going to have Shazam for birds so I can just hold my phone up and identify birds? And the reality is birds have dialects. Birds are singing in places where other animal sounds are happening. You know, frogs are calling and other birds are calling and there's slamming doors and, and you're not always close to the bird. And so between dialects and also repertoires, you know, a single bird can sing many, many different songs. That makes Shazam for birds or identifying birds with an app on your phone really challenging. Um, and, but, but that's why you need a hundred or more recordings because you need to capture that variation. If, if a bird sings a single song, you could probably train an algorithm with five recordings. But if you, you know, if there's any kind of variation that's regional dialects or repertoire, you need a lot more. And so the, that is exactly the reason why we try to feed a lot of recordings into our training models so that we can handle dialects and things like that. The next tier is to train the models to recognize not just what species it is, but what region it's from, you know, because, and that should be feasible, but because of the dialects. Thank you. Well, I think that's all the questions we have in chat currently. You're getting a lot of uh, praise and appreciation. Thanks um, your way, Mike. Um, so if anyone else has a question, now's a good time. I do have a question. Um, there's recently been a lot of uh, talk about the fact that the white-throated sparrows are changing their song, that the mm -hmm. there's a, basically a dialect shift going on. Uh, right. How does that? How does your software handle something like that, or do, or do you just have to add more recordings? Well, there's yeah. Let me let me say a side comment, and then I'll get back to your actual question. The side comment is that 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 example, of the white-throated sparrows, was one that I was thinking of putting into this talk because it's a beautiful example of how to use recordings from a collection like the Macaulay Library to understand the biology of animals. So it's recordings from the Macaulay and also from Zeno Canto. You might be familiar with Zeno Canto. Um, the recordings in those two collections were used for the research that you're talking about. And it's because those recordings existed that we realized that there's a dialect shift happening where um, a dialect from one region of that species is shifting into a different part of the range of the same species. Um, so that's the side comment. The question is exactly what you said. We just need more recordings of the different dialects and feed those into the training model so that the algorithm knows that if it's this, this song or this song, they're both the same species. I found it very interesting that having moved only two and a half miles in a six mile radius, two and a half miles, that our Northern Cardinals actually have a slightly different dialect. Yep. Yeah, dialects are fascinating because you can get very big changes over short distances depending on the biology of the birds. You know, it has to do with how far the young move from where they're born, when they learn these songs, do they learn it early in life versus later in life and things like that. All of those things feed into determining how much regional difference or dialects you have uh, between populations. Even the titmouses are different. Yeah. The ones near yeah. me go, I need you, I need you, versus the Peter, <laughs> Peter, Peters. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Okay. Well, he's got well. questions. I've got one. I've got one more question I'd like to ask. Okay. It's kind of a, okay, Rich. Uh, I'm going to go hit evolution here on you. Let's go All back right. sixty-six plus million years ago. We have nice dinosaurs, the bird uh, bird precursors mm -hmm. running around. Uh, is there describe for me what you think is the evidence that they sang just as well as birds do today? Oh, that, okay. That's a great question. Um, well, I will say. A couple of things. So I'm really bad with time frames. So I can't remember, you know, what an ancestral birds were like 66 million years ago. Um, but I, and, you know, I don't need to tell you because I think you already know, but there's a lot of evidence that, you know, modern birds descended from dinosaurs. We yes. now know from a lot of fossil evidence that 
the dinosaurs were feathered, at least most of them, um, especially the Tyrannosaur group um, from which a lot of birds derived. Um, the one nice thing about the syrinx as a um, structure, the voice box of birds, is that it actually fossilizes. Um, and so in early in the pretty early evolution of birds, we do have fossil syrinx. And so that suggests pretty um, advanced vocal abilities for those early birds. But those are birds, that's early birds. It's not um, pre-bird ancestors. And I honestly don't know, um, you know, I'm not up on my um, archeology span evidence uh, of what sort of, you know, anatomy dinosaurs, the ancestral, the ancestors of birds, what sort of vocal anatomy they had. Um, they do have, a, they did have a lot of similarities uh, to modern birds, including um, hollow bones and air sacs, which birds have. And so they may have had, you know, something analogous to or, or um, ancestral to the modern syrinx. I just don't know. Thanks. Appreciate it. Well, great. So I just want to reiterate, this was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed yeah. it. I really would hope to get to Webster Grove physically someday. Um, but I guess virtually is as close as I can get right now. Look us up when you come here. Uh, I will, got, most definitely. Between St. Louis Audubon and Webster Grove's Nature Study Society, we'll likely have a field trip you can join us on. Oh, and yes. Maybe I see that Eurasian that. tree sparrow. Yeah, <laughs> make sure it stays around there so I can. <laughs> We haven't gotten rid of it yet. <laughs> Pretty abundant. It's been, it's been here over 130 years, so. <laughs> good. <laughs> yeah, anyway, we, but there's lots of other good birds out here too. So don't, you know, right. we're, we're joking as much as being realistic. Uh, <laughs> there's lots of good, good stuff to see around here. We're, uh, David will tell you that we've got tons of warblers that come through every spring and fall. 